Here we have the Heathkit preamplifier and controller units. The model is UMC1 for the mono and USC1 for the stereo unit. I have chosen these two models for these highlighted reasons. And this video is our part one. We will continue with these circuits in the part two when we cover valve preamplifiers in a greater depth and take a good look at other models to compare. We have now the two circuit diagrams and a summary spec sheets for both models and a jump to contents card to repeat sections of the video when you need to and a finer index section. Here is service technician Phil Moss who will take you through the units. This is a very typical Heath kit manual and it's in the typical yellow and black. It's got very clear printing on it and as we go through it you'll see that everything is clearly printed. The next page tells you how to read the color code for resistors and below the resistors they give you a way of coding capacitors when they too have color spots on them. Now that style of capacitor is no longer made so you won't see those nowadays but if you're dealing with components um, of yesteryear you may need to be able to read them. And the side is, if you're looking for vintage components, it tends to be a good idea not to buy things like this. And indeed, the resistors, um, if they're the old carbon composition, they will almost certainly have changed value and got high. Many of these capacitors, they might be called mica molds, but the reason a lot of them leak is because actually inside they're waxed paper. So again, treat them with suspicion because they may have gone leaky. This shows one of the very clear diagrams for constructing the equipment. Now there are boxes here that tell you what to do in order, but note all of them have this little box and you can see it's ticked. This manual is from a kit that has been made up and the person has done what they're supposed to do. They have followed the instructions in the order Heathkit tell you to do them. And when you have done each stage, you tick it so you don't lose your place. It's particularly important to keep to their order when dealing with wiring. Um, here, if you were to skip a couple of places you would notice there are a couple of blank spaces on the circuit board with wiring you may not see that and also with wiring switches um, in one place clearly you have to have two components one piggybacking the other and they give you a clear um, drawing here of how that should be done they don't assume you have a great deal of knowledge. So at the front of every Heathkit manual, apart from telling you the color code, they introduce you to circuit symbols and they give you a short tutorial on soldering. Soldering being absolutely essential to get right or your product won't work. However carefully you have followed their instructions and got everything in the right place. A lot of people think soldering is simple. No, it isn't. It was quite some time when I was young before I managed to get to make reliable joints. And as I say, it's not a minor thing. Um, and you need to be able to make every joint reliably soldered and not cook components or wires whilst you're doing it. Having a good soldering iron helps. In our next illustration, You've got more of the same of that circuit board, but fitting the rest of the components. Now, in some cases, you might think it doesn't matter which components you fit first. In some cases, however, it does because you can't fit things when other things are in the way. And particularly with mechanical assemblies, it is very important indeed to follow it. And frankly, there's no real reason why you shouldn't um, follow them in the order that Heathkit suggests anyway. There's no advantage to skipping things. Now here they give you a very clear picture from two different angles of what you're to do and somewhere there would have been a list to tick of each stage. Notice here on the right 
They tell you the color to use and the length of wire to cut. Um, they supply the wire. They don't supply a great deal of excess. Um, if you don't pre-cut them, then you have to work with little spools of wire knocking around, which is very inconvenient. And of course, if you have to thread the wires through holes in the chassis, then you can't do it with a spool on the end. So it is very important to cut them to the right length first time and not to use too much or you'll run out or to cut it too short when you have to replace it. This is the mono version. Very neat, very straightforward front panel. It's got all you need. Input select, the treble and the bass and the volume. Now, unlike the more complex stereo version, this simply has an in-out for the low-pass filter, in other words, scratch filter. The stereo version actually had a pot on it so that one could adjust the slope. Um, as I say, on this one, it was a simpler circuit. Um, nice professional looking product. If you're going to build something from a kit, it is nice when you finish up with something that looks perfectly well as though you could have bought it ready-made from a known manufacturer of hi-fi equipment or indeed for their test equipment. That's an overview. It's quite simple. There's just two valves in the F86 and an ECC83. Notice on the circuit board that there is labeling despite the fact that if you've been assembling this with their instructions, you would have got things in the right order anyway, but to help you, they also mark all the components. Some of them, like the one I'm pointing to, are obscured by having the component on top of them. And some of them, like this one here, it's very clear what its number is. It's obviously helpful if you can read it after putting the component, partly if you're coming back to service it. Although if you still got the circuit diagram and the layout diagrams, it's not that much of a problem. If you bought one of these, that and that look like components that are going to need to be replaced because they're almost certainly leaky. These look to me very much like their wax paper capacitors and at this age, they're almost certainly leaky. This unit has been nicely built. Um, the wiring is neat, not perhaps up to factory standards, to be honest. For instance, take this mode wire. It goes over there and gently bends. If this was factory made, it would be sharply right angled and down. But at the same time, if I'd have built this, I'd have been quite happy with my standard of work. This is a good product. A lot of the resistors used here are in fact of the carbon composition type and they are likely to have drifted a long way out of tolerance. Um, if this was mine, I'd be measuring valve voltages to see if they are realistic and I would probably change a few of these anyway, particularly around the input valve. A weakness of this design appears to be that they're all carbon composition resistors and they're not cracked carbon. Nowadays I simply change them for metal film. It would improve the noise performance. It's not sensible to replace them all um, because many of them will not affect the noise performance of it. The electrolytics, there are people who love changing electrolytics. I've just gone and pointed the four in view out. Uh, unless I had reason to believe they fail like they're leaking or the voltages across them were low, or this one got hot. I would not change them because this isn't that old a product, and I think you'll find that the electrolytics are actually all fine. That's an underview. It looks quite a simple circuit board. Actually, it looks a lot simpler underneath, doesn't it, than it does from the top. Most components are on there, but there are quite a few which of necessity are clustered around the switches because otherwise there will be a lot of additional wiring. And as a lot of that switching is on the input circuit, you do not want a lot of um, wires, unscreened wires, 
carrying in some cases small signals. Some of the inputs like radio and tape will be fairly high level, but microphone and also the deck input are low level and susceptible to hum pickup. So you do want to keep the wiring to a minimum for them. In the next picture, you will see the stereo version. Um, that is very similar in the circuit, but they're not identical. They also needed for some reason to move a lot of the controls away from the front panel. And as you see, there is a metal plate and there are extensions on the pots, taking the knobs through via shafts to the controls. With its six valves, um, three per channel, it is actually a rather more complex than the mono. And also it relies on push buttons for the input selection. Push buttons are very convenient to use, but it's much harder to understand the wiring, which is why in my description of the stereo unit, I actually used a generic uh, drawing that I did um, and not the original circuit, because the original circuit has lots and lots of crossed wires and it's very difficult to follow when you're a professional trying to service it. It is a disadvantage of push button selection, and this is true of radios as well. There are many, particularly of the German radios, you may recall, that have uh, push buttons for wave band selection and also for tone selection quite often. They're very functional, very easy to use instead of turning a knob, but they are not fun if the thing goes wrong from a service point of view, where a rotary is so much simpler. It's fairly conventional. So we have the EF86 where I've described in various places as a low noise, high gain amplifier specifically designed for low level audio use, even though they turn up in power amplifiers. You have a selection of inputs a couple of them because you don't know what level you're going to find from things like radios. They've actually given you a preset pot on the back. Although as drawn, I think it is actually drawn as being variable. That arrow should in fact be a flat head to denote that it's a preset. So there's attenuation for the high level inputs. Um, before they are fed to the grid, which is selected by this switch, which is gained with the compensation. There are two types of input from this point of view. There are those that are flat, i.e. one does not need to equalize the frequency response, only the level of amplification. And there are those for magnetic cartridge, for instance, or tape head, where you have to have frequency compensation. For a magnetic cartridge, you need to cut the treble and boost the bass, whilst leaving the middle uh, flat. And this is the standard two resistors, each with a capacitor across it, which is switched in for that purpose, whereas the others are simply changing the gain. So one would have low gain for the radio input, but for a microphone input, it might well be at a low level and one needs plenty of gain, depends what microphone they're designing it for. For someone using this at home, they're probably not going for a very expensive but very low level output, and they're probably using a microphone that's already got a transformer built in. There is no transformer here, so if you put a 200 or 600 ohm microphone in, one might find the volume has to be turned up full, and one might find that the preamp is rather noisy. So that's the equalization section. It then feeds in to the first half from the ECC83, that ubiquitous audio preamp valve. Itself low noise and itself usable with low level inputs, but partly because it doesn't have an anti-hum designed heater, it is not as low hum as the EF86 but it is still good for most low level inputs. So this one is simply a voltage amplifier, which then feeds two sections. Here, 
we have a low pass filter as they call it. It's a scratch filter. So if you switch it in, that capacitor short circuits some of the high frequencies to earth. Then there is a resistor and the capacitor, which again attenuates the highest frequencies. And then they have a third section that does exactly the same. When this is switched out, however, these capacitors simply bypass the resistors, leaving the circuit flat. On the stereo version, one of the differences is that instead of an in-out control, they actually have a pot, so you can vary the slope of the filter. On this one, they have gone for something simpler, and it's simply in-out, but the actual circuit is basically the same, with three capacitors and the two resistors. On the input, they're relying on the input impedance from the valve, to be the resistor used in series with that capacitor for the filter. Over here, we have a very famous circuit, the Baxendall Tone Control, designed by Peter Baxendall, a gentleman who many years ago, I was privileged to go to a lecture given by him, um, arranged by the Audio Engineering Society. One of the questions he was asked was which did he prefer, valve amplifiers or transistor amplifiers? And he gave um, what I think was an, a predictable answer, a good amplifier is a good amplifier. In other words, although he worked most of his life, if not all his working life, in valves, he wasn't going to say, oh, you have to have a valve amplifier. Um, many modern semiconductor amplifiers are perfectly good, but anyway. Peter Baxendall, who designed this tone circuit. Now, you may not immediately understand how it works. It's based on negative feedback. So in the middle position, the signal coming from this valve and the feedback are balanced. The tone control has no effect whatsoever. It's flat. However, when one adjusts the controls to the left, the negative feedback which comes in at this end of the pot in each case is reduced. And therefore the signal is increased. Now, there is a frequency selective network, otherwise it would simply be another volume control. This is the base control. These two capacitors short circuit the treble frequencies across the pot. Therefore, it is only effective at low frequencies. Conversely, with the treble control, although there is nothing to stop bass being fed back across the pot, that provides um, negative feedback at the bass frequencies, this capacitor here blocks all but the treble frequencies from being fed through to the center point and hence to the grid of the valve. So again, if you turn this to the left, all the treble is fed through, no bass or middle, and you get treble boost. But if you turn it to the right, then you get heavy negative feedback from the anode of the valve through there to the grid and you get treble cut. Now, some versions of the Baxendall require that you have a tapped pot for the treble, and that tap point is earthed. In this case, it's a version that doesn't need a special pot. This is much to be preferred because getting tapped pots, they're not made as standard. Um, so you have a big problem if you need to replace it, or indeed if you wish to copy the original Baxendall circuit. Whereas this one, you can get a pot um, of this value or something close, and the same with the base. Very effective tone control. You see various versions of it with different um, values of components used, but in principle they're the same. Now if you multiply the capacitor values by 10 and divide the resistors by 10 approximately, 
This circuit is used in many solid state circuits because the Baxendall was so effective that when the transistor came along, it was often used. There is a competitor, the Mullard passive controls were often used. And if you look at Mullard circuits, they always use the passive and not the Baxendall. Um, whether Peter Baxendall had a patent on this, which deterred other manufacturers from using it or recommending it because they would have to pay the patent charge, I don't know. But there are two very different ones. Um, in some circumstances, the passive is much more useful. In some circumstances, this is to be preferred. I tend to build things using the Baxendall. So moving on to the output stage, there's nothing particularly interesting about this. Um, the volume control is on the output. A refinement to this circuit, although of course when you're buying something that's already been made up as a kit or made up already and you're not designing it for yourself. Another triode on the output as a cathode follower will be very useful giving you a low impedance output. The problem with this circuit is that it is not suitable for running a long coax cable on the output because of capacitance. You might also get hum pickup, which you wouldn't get with a low impedance output, but the cost of an extra valve is a deterrent for them including it. Now, something that might be seen as notable is the HT, which is shown as being 180 to 300. Frankly, this circuit would work with a much higher voltage on the HT, providing these capacitors are rated to take it and not explode. But there would be no advantage of having more than 300 volts. Conversely, I suspect this would work perfectly well at 100 volts, not 180. The only thing would be that the maximum output level before it distorted would be reduced. But on the other hand, this is probably used to drive a power amplifier with an input requirement well below one volt to RMS. And I suspect that with 180 volts, never mind 300 of HT, it will give 10 volts RMS output without distortion. Therefore, if you were to greatly limit the undistorted output by reducing the HT, it wouldn't matter because your power amp doesn't need the big swing anyway. Most valve circuits will work with a wide range of voltage. There are obviously exceptions. Um, I don't think a television picture due will be very keen on having the voltages widely uh, varied. And in instruments, it is necessary to regulate the supply if you're to get it to work within its specification. But in audio, generally, it isn't that important. There is an additional output through this resistor, which is before the volume control. That's for feeding a tape recorder. And by having a resistor in series, the loading of the input impedance of the tape recorder doesn't affect your signal output level here. Unless, of course, you try running that into um, a very low impedance. But then you're probably not going to be using this with a professional recorder with a 600 ohm input. And so that's about it for the Heathkit UMC1 preamplifier. One would have thought the stereo would basically be twice the mono, just adding a couple of things like the mono stereo switch and the balance. Whilst the circuits are very similar, there are a number of subtle changes. One of them is that the inputs are selected by push buttons. The disadvantage of push buttons over rotary controls, particularly if one's trying to explain them or service them, is that there are lines drawn all over the place and it's virtually impossible to understand it. So what I have done here is have a simplified version showing how the equalization is arranged around the first EF86 and the input connectors. So on the left hand of this circuit diagram, 
There seems to be a rather lonely EF86 which goes nowhere except having an earth rail in common with the rest of the circuit. As I say, I will come to the equalization in a generic circuit drawn later. So, ignoring that and simply going to the input EF86 here, high gain, low noise amplifier, I've gone over this several times before and won't go over the details of that circuit again. We have something unusual here going down to a switch, which conveniently, if I didn't know what it was, tells me it's the rumble filter. So how does that work? In the switched out position, the signal is simply passed straight through to the next stage. In operation, when that is connected there, however, the signal has to pass through these capacitors. Now, capacitors obviously have an increasing reactance with reducing frequency. So here we have a filter with a resistor in the middle and the rest of the circuit constitutes the resistor on the output here. And that has the effect of rolling off the base frequencies whilst passing middle and treble unattenuated. There is another complication down here in the mono stereo switch. One needs a mono stereo switch, obviously, either because one has got a mono source and one wants it to come out of both speakers, or because one has a noisy source. And by switching into mono, one often reduces the effect of either surface noise on a record or um, noise from a tape recording. But also, if one has an FM stereo tuner without a stereo switch, uh, there is a degradation in signal to noise ratio of about 30 dB, which is big, between stereo and mono. So if you have a noisy signal, if you cannot switch it into mono on the tuner itself, you can switch it into mono on your preamplifier and the signal to noise ratio will greatly improve. Moving on, we have the Baxendall tone control circuit. If you look at the values in here, they are, for some reason, slightly different to the values that were used in the mono unit, for reasons I do not know. I explained how the Baxendall worked in my video on the mono unit, and so shall not go over it again here. Another difference is, as I pointed out in the mono, it simply had a switch low pass filter in other words, noise filter. In this circuit, however, one has a pot. So one has the choice of the slope of the filter, in other words, how harshly it works. On the good recording, obviously one would want not to use it at all because it restricts the high frequencies. On something noisy, or if you're playing 78 records which are intrinsically noisy, because shellac is intrinsically noisy and the frequency is very restricted, you would probably want to put this on with the maximum slope. It's not a passive control because you can see there's negative feedback via there feeding into it. So the 6 dB per octave that you get per stage of a simple RC filter is sharpened up a lot. Now, I talked before about a simplified circuit around the input valve. We'll now go to my simplified drawing. This should probably be very familiar to you from other circuits if you looked at other circuits. In this feedback circuit, it's between anode and grid. There may or may not be, depending on which input and which circuit, a resistor here between the input socket and the grid. So here we have the RIAA circuit with these particular values. If you look at different circuits, you'll find there are different values of capacitor and resistor used, but they all have in common the same time constants. So this circuit is flat for the mid range of audio signals. It seriously attenuates the high frequency end and it boosts the bass end 
both of those statements being relative to the middle, which simply there is flat feedback, negative feedback. And that is chosen to give the right amount of gain, which is considerable for a magnetic pickup of the modern type. Um, if it was a 78 pickup, you would stick it into one of the auxiliary inputs and need quite a lot of attenuation because they had much higher outputs. For mic and radio and tape, you do not need frequency compensation, so you just have a resistor, but the value of that resistor varies. Radio may well be the highest output, so you would have the lowest value of resistor to give you the lowest gain. Microphone needs the highest gain, whatever type of microphone you put in here, and therefore this resistor will be the highest value, and the tape input would probably be somewhere between them. On some preamplifiers, um, you are given a pot, a preset pot on the back, and you adjust it for your particular equipment, because there are no fixed standards for the outputs of tape recorders or radios. Yes, in Europe there are DIN standards, and even those are somewhat variable, whether it's the 50 or 100 millivolt. But if you had a professional tape machine, for instance, the output would probably be normalised for 0.775 volts. In other words, a great deal more than domestic. For tape head, you have maximum bass boost and a great deal of treble cut. Partly because there is pre-emphasis in the recording on tape, as indeed there is on records uh, on the RIA ca characteristic. In both cases, that's because the medium has an increasing amount of noise with increasing frequency. But also the way a tape um, operates, even if you have a flat recording, it's all bass boost and a great deal of treble cut and the simple circuit there for the equalization. Now, if you were to see the original circuit with these three compensation networks fed through push buttons, you would find it very difficult to understand. Therefore, I'm not showing it. I'm only showing my simplified generic version. This is typical of virtually all valve preamps. And there is something very similar for se uh, semiconductor ones, whether they're transistor or integrated circuit. They all, in principle, use the same time constants, and they all, in principle, use the same circuit, even though, obviously, for transistors, the values would be very different. Due to a technical glitch, we had to cut the end of Phil explaining the output section. Here we have the balance pot highlighted. The stereo volume parts gang together for outputs A and B, which are your left and right channels to feed to the power amplifier. We have a fixed output for the tape record signal, an invert switch for the stereo A and B left and right channels, something we don't need nowadays with the hard panning techniques which were used on the early stereo dialogue recordings. Phil mentioned the output is taken from the second half of the ECC83 anode. It is very rare to find domestic equipment with a cathode follower output. They don't expect long cable lines to be driven. However, page 3 of the manual mentions that due to the applied feedback around the last valve, the output impedance is fairly low, which allows cable lengths of up to 10 feet to be used without tailing off the high frequencies. With the mono unit, the line output is high impedance at 47k, also, the signal output voltage is much lower at 0.25 volts. This may be plenty for a lot of power amplifiers, the Mullard 520 for example, and with some models can even be too much. With the stereo unit, the audio signal output voltage is a lot better with up to 1.3 volt full output. Here is a health and safety note for people who use vintage audio equipment. The user manual also warns that for the HT high voltage negative return, they have used the audio outer cable which connects between the power amplifier and the preamplifier. This can cause an electric shock when connecting the audio cables with the power amplifier switched on. I'm not sure why they didn't use the octal connector like many other manufacturers did of the time. You can learn from a bad example, not all vintage audio was a sensible idea. If you're a guitarist or a musician, please take extra care.
when using vintage audio equipment like this. Consult with a good qualified service technician to safety check and amend any vintage item before use. The Dynaco Stereo 70 amplifier also has safety concerns very similar to those mentioned, which we covered in a dedicated video. Please be sure to watch our health and safety video before the use of any vintage audio electronic equipment. We will return to these Heathkit circuits in our follow-up video when we discuss other valve preamplifiers to compare. These will include the Leak .1 Plus, the Quad Control 22 and the Radford SC models as well as the Mullard 2 and 3 valve circuits. The Quad is another favourite. The inputs offer tape, mic, line and phono stages. We have a fixed EQ, tone controls and filters. The same valves are used, the EF86 Green Pentode and the ECC83 Dual Triode. There are no balancing transformers on the inputs or the outputs, but these units are often converted with the use of audio transformers. The components are of exceptional quality and many recording studio engineers have used them in the recording chain. They can be easily adapted to match the voltage levels and have balanced audio signals. The Radford units are my top choice of the vintage preamplifiers. The line stage is way superior as well as a tone circuit and filters. However, with the SC22 model, there is a transistor in the first stage of the phono and the mic amplifier. And from my experience, it sounded poor, but the rest of the circuit at line level was superb. I fully recommend the Radford amplifiers. We have a technician who can upgrade these units to a full valve circuitry Please contact us if you need that. There is a CAFO follower on the SC3 model and again on the Revox G36 tape machine. We will follow up in part 2 when we cover this subject in a further depth. Some of the professional mixing consoles have them as well, the tube based ones, so that's worth going into. Phil is going to move on with radios and our studio technician will jump on board with the design, service and repair of professional audio electronics. Our website is able to take members. Please join and support what we are doing. Online members can download circuit diagrams, technical manuals and scan data, as well as our videos and JPEGs associated with the tutorials. We are getting the forum and the quiz section ready. It's now in process.